if our reporting best practices webinar. Um, we appreciate you taking your time to join Dwayne and I. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Sarah Eckert. I am a consultant with GuideHouse and I'm working with the state of Missouri and with the uh, Department of Mental Health DD to on their value-based payment program. Um, so today we wanna take some time, Dwayne and I do want to just kind of talk about our best practices, things we've seen, um, kind of tips and tricks when it comes to the reporting within REDCap specifically for employment services. Um, so Dwayne and I will kind of be bouncing back and forth. We have a kind of crosswalk guide that we will share on, Dwayne will share on screen and then we will send it out to everyone as well as a good reference tool that walks through every potential field within REDCap and then provides a description of what we're looking for there as well as the like acceptable accepted value, what we're hope we're anticipating that you'll be able to enter on that data reporting piece. So before I do turn turn it over to Dwayne, just a couple general things around REDCap that I want to touch base on. Um, first and foremost is that we are here for you if you run into any issues or have any questions when it comes to REDCap. Um, feel free to reach out to the VVP email, which I will drop in the chat at any time. We do consistently monitor that email um, address. I actually currently have it pulled up right now responding to some folks. But if you run into anything or have any questions, please reach out. Um, this is a learning you know, experience for everyone involved. And so we want to work with you to ensure that the system is working how we anticipate it working. And if you run into anything that we can get with you right away to work through that reporting, especially as we're coming up to the close of a reporting period. Um, so please always reach out when it comes to REDCap. We'll always happily respond to emails or hop on the phone, share screens if need be to walk through things. So do always reach out on that. Um, a few other things when it comes to REDCap, just in general reporting wise, um, when it comes to employment, do you know that we're also looking against authorizations that are done through Seymour um, to ensure that any individual that's being reported on within REDCap also has an active um, authorization to ensure that they're the ones receiving that service. So we do do that check. Um, we will deny payment for any reporting for anyone who does not have an authorization. Um, please do keep that in mind that we do look in that. Um, in addition, one big thing, and we'll pull up a visual, and I know Dwayne will talk, talk about it a lot too, is that when you're working within REDCap, when you finish up a form reporting for an individual, you must mark the form as complete. That is the kind of the trigger, the impetus then for the reviewers to go in and review a record is that we're only looking at records that are marked as complete. Um, that partly that is because of just how the system is set up, but we also do understand that you may be entering information into a form, realize you may need to go somewhere else to pull that information and come back to that form. So we wanna allow you that ability to do so. Um, Every form within a red cap, the last question asks if the form is complete or not. It defaults to incomplete and at the end, you must mark it as complete. And then that's what we use across all incentives across every form to be as kind of the, you know, the trigger for them for us to go in and review it. So that being said, just kind of a little set up of how we're set up for today is that, like I said, we're going to walk through kind of a, what we put together, a crosswalk, a data entry guide, and answer any questions you have about entering data. At any point, if you have a question, please feel free to speak up, um, unmute yourself, and uh, go ahead and ask your question or drop it in the chat. We can constantly monitoring that to make sure we're answering questions in real time. So that being said, I'll hand it over to Dwayne. All right, thank you, Sarah. Um, for those who I've not met on the call, my name is Dwayne Shoemate, and I'm the Director of Employment Community Engagement for the Division of Developmental Disabilities. Uh, the other thing I will just add is that we are recording this, uh, and we'll have a copy of this recording available uh, on our website in case individuals would like to reference back to this uh, in the future. This is the second of two sessions. We did a session on Friday afternoon and uh, hope to have uh, a good discussion today as we really help uh, individuals that are um, completing the reporting have a good understanding of how to go through and actually complete that process. Uh, we are currently in the process of uh, being in an open period for quarter three reporting. Um, 
or excuse me, reporting for the performance period of quarter three, which would it be from January through the end of March. Uh, and so we do apologize. This guide has not been made available earlier, uh, but we did have just very few um, uh, concerns that arose uh, with the reporting that we saw in uh, quarter one and quarter two that was completed earlier this year. So I think uh, by and large, folks are having a, a good understanding of the pay for reporting process for employment services as well as the questions. But we definitely wanted to get this resource out there uh, to help individuals because not all times are the questions as intuitive as we had hoped and desired. So with that, I am going to start sharing uh, my screen. Uh, this guide will be uh, made available. Sorry, I'm getting some weird messages. Um, this guide will be made available uh, on the website uh, and to each of you uh, participating uh, in today's webinar. And so just before I get to speaking too much, just wanting to confirm, uh, is the guide currently showing if uh, Somebody yes. can give me a, all right, thank you, sir. Uh, so, um, again, with the guide, the intent is to go through and provide just a, a high level overview of employment, uh, pay for reporting um, by service definition and a clarity of each of the questions and operational definition uh, of the question and the type of data that is accepted uh, as an acceptable response. Uh, so, the beginning of the guide just talks about the guide itself. Uh, it provides a little bit of information about the employment services pay for reporting on who is it available for, uh, what it's for, uh, what needs to be completed, uh, when it will begin, why we're doing it, and then how to uh, uh, how one becomes eligible for payment. So moving forward uh, past that page, uh, each of the five employment service definitions has its own section. Uh, this first section that you'll see is benefits planning. Um, subsequent sweat sections are on career planning, pre vocational services, job development, and then supportive employment. Uh, each of the sections of the guide has the question or the data field as it appears in red cap, and then help text uh, to provide guidance on what type of information uh, is being asked with that particular question. And then uh, the third column provides what is an acceptable value for the answer. For many of these uh, acceptable values, the, uh, the response field is tied down to where it's only a yes or no question or it requires a specific date entry. Uh, but there are some where um, when you're doing the reporting that you actually have to free type in information. And so again, the acceptable value is there to give you guidance on what would or would not be considered acceptable. Uh, what we are doing is anytime someone's going through, if they haven't fully completed the form or if they provided a value that is not an acceptable value, then GuideHouse has been contacting those provider agencies uh, requesting correction. And there is a very specific correction period uh, that's allowed to go in and update uh, and refine the information that was entered. Uh, so I, I'm not going to go through in detail all of the fields because um, that would be boring and uh, we'll make the guide available to everybody to go through it and read. But a couple of things that I do want to kind of point out. One of the things that we have seen some um, variation in the response has been um, when did the individual, uh, or excuse me, what was the service start date? So what we are looking at in service start date is the first date in which billable activity occurred for the individual. And the service start date must be prior to the performance period that's being reported. Uh, but again, it can be um, prior to any performance period. So what we are looking at here is if someone started a service in April of 20, uh, excuse me, April of 2022, if that was when the first billable activity occurred for benefits planning, career planning, any of the other services, that is what we're looking for in the uh, service start date. Um, I know we've seen instances where people are changing the start date for each reporting period uh, to what the first billable activity was within that particular uh, reporting period. Uh, again, in those instances, uh, we are wanting to ensure that we're indicating the very first billable activity 
and not just the billable activity within that reporting period. Uh, the reason we're looking at when the first billable activity occurred is because eventually when we have several quarters of data submitted, what we'll be looking at is what was the length of time uh, in calendar days that it's taking individuals to complete that particular service. So that's why we do want to ensure that the start date is the first date in which any billable activity occurred. And uh, again, regardless of what quarter uh, that might have occurred. Uh, the, the end date would be, you know, whenever the individual completed the service. So again, with benefits planning, you know, we go through and uh, uh, continue to ask a, a series of questions. Uh, the number of units delivered during this reporting period. Uh, this is where a whole number is needed, whether it's one unit, two units, or three units. We are actually looking at units of service and not just a time. Um, and I see that Richard raised his hand with a question, so I will pause there. And Richard, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, I was just curious. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so when you put in, like for benefits planning, for example, when you put in someone, can it not populate that for that same client each month so you don't have to go back and look up that service date? Do you know what I mean? Yes, uh, excellent question. And uh, that's why we make the previous reporting periods available is so then that way providers are able to go back and look at the previous reports. Uh, to see what they had entered at start date. But as far as it auto populating forward, uh, I'll let Sarah address that question because she's become more of the expert on the programming piece of, of REDCap. I, thank you, Dwayne. Um, I like to think that we're all learning together here. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do the auto population on that. It's just that how um, REDCap operates. But like Joanne said, that's why we um, are not hiding or taking away like any previous information that you've entered. So that while you, unfortunately, you do need to go back and look at that date, um, you should be able to access and view all your previous records. So you can look at the previous record for that individual within the system and not necessarily need to go out of the system and look elsewhere again for that. Okay, thank you. And we did have um, we did have another question come through the chat regarding the start date. Um, someone asked, "What if the client has multiple authorizations? We should enter a date reflective on authorizations that may have already ended." Correct. Yeah. So the start date uh, here, what we're we're not necessarily looking at particular authorizations. This would be when the service started. So if someone was receiving. Benefits planning, but uh, it's been authorized two or three different times within the period of the plan year or overlapping a plan year. What we're really looking at is when did the first billable activity of benefits planning occur uh, for the individual. And then we have another question just come in asking, can data be exported into a printable report? Yes, it can be. Uh, if you and I can show, a, I'll pull up a, a dummy entry within REDCap and can show this that yes, you can get in within REDCap and do a download or a download a PDF of the instrument and you can choose to either download a blank version of the form um, or you can choose to export it and download the version you're looking at with all the data in it. That is, you are able to do that as well. So Sarah, um, I wanna make a little note here for myself when we get done reviewing the guide and I know we go to the test site uh, I want to make a, a note where um, when you bring that site up that we can make sure to show folks how to do that. Okay. Okay. Other questions right now? Okay. Uh, so moving forward, as we do talk about number of units delivered, again, you can see it provides help text. That way, what we are asking is the count of service units. Uh, and again, the service units for all employment services are quarter hour uh, units of time. So what we are looking at is the number of units. Uh, so again, this number would be one unit, could go as high as 999 units, uh, you know, that is delivered within this particular reporting period. Uh, the length of time, um, this is one that's auto-calculated. 
uh, based upon stakeholder feedback from our employment advisory team. So we don't ask you to actually fill that in, but this field does auto calculate. So if we ever have a field that is uh, automatically populating, we do note that it is a field that's auto calculating. Um, again, when we do talk earnings, um, monthly earnings, uh, you know, we some of the some of the questions and some of the services, it, it, it'll talk about an hourly uh, earning or a wage. Uh, some also talk about monthly earnings. So again, that's where we do, you know, provide that help text just to clarify that we are talking monthly, for example, in this uh, example for benefits planning, and we provide you what those limits are. Um, I don't know that we would ever have anybody making more than $9,999 in a month uh, who's on waiver. Uh, because that would be a, an annual income of over $120,000 a year. But if there is ever an instance where you have a, uh, a data point that needs to be entered that's beyond uh, the acceptable values, that's where you'd post a question to the DMHDDBVP help desk. And then uh, uh, Sarah uh, and myself and others from the Guidehouse team will look at how we would go about um, you know, creating an exemption. Uh, to that exception. Uh, so again, you know, kind of going through questions. Um, I'll just kind of leave it on the screen here so folks can kind of look at the question and examples of help text. Um, you know, this is in a PDF format and will be made available, like I said, on the website. Uh, so for those who may need screen readers, uh, it is set up in grids to where it should work with screen readers as well. Um, all right. Uh, if we do ever have a question uh, where there is the opportunity to select other, uh, just note a text response is required. Um, I know we have seen some instances where people have checked other and not uh, completed the text box. Uh, again, just a reminder in the help text, uh, when there is an opportunity for other uh, that there is a response uh, required in the narrative section. Again, we don't want long responses, just a matter of two or three words are sufficient, but just something to give us an idea as to why uh, other was selected. And you'll see this as an example again here on uh, work incentives reviewed, and you'll see that there is the opportunity to, to provide other and provide other text. The main reason uh, we do have the narrative field is just so we have an idea of why someone may be checking other, but also what this will enable us to do is if we continue to see similar responses appearing in the other uh, area, uh, then what we can do is go back and revise the reporting and make that as one of the selected options uh, if it is something that's frequently uh, noted by uh, those entering in reporting. Okay, so um, that is benefits planning. Um, at that point in time, we'll kind of move on to career planning. Um, like I said, you know, not that we will go individually through all the questions, uh, but again, just um, uh, to demonstrate that we do have this for each of the fields in career planning, uh, lined out the same way with the help text and an acceptable value. Uh, one caution that I will provide is the way that the questions appear in here may not necessarily be the exact order that they appear as you're completing the reporting. Uh, we do have business rules designed in REDCap uh, that depending upon how you may answer a question or a set of questions, uh, it will trigger additional fields to pop up. Uh, one of these as an example is, did the individual successfully finish the service? Um, you know, so uh, if someone has successfully finished the service, you will get a different set of questions than someone who's entered the service but not successfully finished. So some of these questions on the left, um, these are just all the questions that could appear based upon the different combinations of responses. But as you are going through the list, if you're not seeing certain questions, when you're doing reporting, uh, don't worry that you've missed something. Uh, it's just that you're seeing the questions uh, that are uh, relevant to uh, the uh, business rules and the way in which you've answered uh, certain questions. 
I'll just point out again here the service start date. Language is same as it was a benefits planning. It's the first date in which billable activity occurred, regardless of the performance period which is being reported. Uh, the other thing I'll note is that uh, what we have seen, and we'll show a, a kind of a, a live example of this uh, once we get through the guide. The other thing is what we have seen is some individuals are um, beginning to report activity that's occurred outside of the, the performance period. So currently, you know, you are able to enter data for January through March, but if something happened the first week of May, we're seeing people beginning to report in the January to March data while they, the service ended May 1st. Um, we're not to this reporting period yet. So just remember when you are reporting today, you're reporting for that which was known January through the end of March. And so if uh, if we are seeing activity reported or dates that are beyond the reporting period, that would lead to correction where we notify the provider, um, even though we understand as you're filling out the form, you may know something differently than what you did uh, during the performance period. Those particular activities and outcomes and dates would be reported in the upcoming reporting period uh, that would begin in July. So you always have to remember you're reporting a uh, delayed quarter of activity. If, and I apologize if I've confused folks with that, but we will give an example uh, of that when we bring up the test site. Okay, with uh, career planning, this is the first time that we've had the opportunity to uh, not just have questions and answers, but to demonstrate a table in career planning, depending upon if the person's actually started the service or not, it will result in a uh, uh, a table of questions um, that uh, you will see at the bottom in the appendices uh, of this document. But this is where, if someone is uh, in career planning, we list a set of different activities that are frequently completed in career planning, and we've provided the help text here of uh, what we mean by distinct events. And then also what we mean by the uh, um, the number of days in which those events or activities occurred. Okay. Uh, here's one where we do ask a desired hourly wage. Uh, in the guide, we do provide you a hyperlink to uh, Missouri Department of Labor. So you can ensure that you are in compliance with current minimum wage laws. Um, and again, we have the data validation here. The data must fall within uh, the Missouri minimum wage uh, requirements. And again, that's because each of our services uh, are intended only for people working in competitive integrated employment uh, settings. So here in career planning, if we're developing an hourly wage goal, uh, it is just making sure that, that is being reported uh, in compliance with wage and hour laws. Okay, so the activities table that we referenced earlier, uh, when you are doing career planning, uh, here we list an operational definition of each of the activities uh, that can be entered on the table within the career planning reporting. Uh, we've provided, uh, again, an, an example of the definition of each of these services. Uh, so if you are unsure, uh, you know, whether something constitutes uh, community based assessment or discovery interview, uh, we're providing a, a definition here so that you can um, delineate between which activity uh, a person may have completed. Okay, as we leave career planning, uh, we'll move into job development, but I will just pause there to see if folks have had any questions arise as they've been uh, completing data entry in REDCap for career planning. Dwayne, this is Vinay. Yes. Um, in the career planning field, when you list the total number of units provided, there are two fields and in the first one i've just been entering zero because instead of instead of leaving it blank um that i just wanted to mention okay 
Uh, Sarah, can you make a note of that? Yes. I think we've seen what you're talking about, Vinay. Okay. Uh, because I know as we've been going through and reviewing all the reports, there's instances where that is populating twice. Um, and I know Sarah and I have talked about we're unsure why that's occurring. So yeah, uh, so so mine, you know, will look like zero one two, or or that's what I'm assuming it looks like on your guys's end because I'm entering a zero in the first field, and then my total number of units in the second one. Okay, so uh, let's uh, when we get to the test site, I'll note this so we can bring that up and make sure we're talking about the same thing. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I know we do have one field as we've gone through the reviews on uh, the total number of units. Uh, when we're looking at it on the back side, we can see where there are two fields um, in that. And, and I'm just not for sure why that's popping up. That That's something we need to go back and look at the uh, behind the scenes programming. Um, and I think, Sarah, you know what I'm talking about where we've had uh, that appeared just above the table. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, we did have another question come in via chat stating, can data regarding successful completion of pre-employment services for those who've been working for some time prior to VVP reporting still be reported for the VVP incentive? Okay. I think I understand the question, but I, I may need to actually see the chat, but I, uh, so the question is clarifying if someone completed a pre-employment and, and I'll call it pre-vocational because we don't really have a pre-employment service definition, but I'm assuming it's pre-vocational services. So if someone's completed pre-vocational services and let's say it was quarter one of last year, um, meaning July 1st through September 30th, is the question, can I now enter that information in for pre-vocational services that were delivered from July 1st to September 30th? Is that is that the question? Wayne, this is Terry Reganald. Yes. That was me. <laughs> I guess what I was wondering so we support several people who've been working for quite some time. So it's kind of a two part question. I'm sorry, it's confusing. So should we go in, should we enter all the pre vocational steps, if you will, data fields that have been completed, even if it was a year ago? Or do you know, that would go towards incentive or we just don't worry about any of that? They've, they've been working this entire fiscal year. We just report on. Uh, the services they're currently receiving and anything prior doesn't matter for the incentive. Uh, correct. Um, correct because we've already closed out of quarter one and quarter two reporting. So uh, we're not able to pay incentives once a reporting period is ended for a performance period. So um, in the January through March 15th reporting period, uh, there was the opportunity to report uh, all activity delivered July through December, but now that we've exited that reporting period, um, all that we are able to um, provide um, payment back on are, is activity uh, delivered and reported uh, January 1st through March 31st. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. I guess in my mind, I didn't know if it would be helpful if data regarding those prevoke activities would, you know, could go into the database just for that information, not even if it's not really for uh, payment for reporting. So that's why it was kind of a two part question, I guess. Right. Thank yeah. you, though. Conceptually, it would be nice if we could, but we already have such a large volume of entries in there um, trying to discern what was newly entered and what was previously entered um, becomes difficult. And so that's where uh, we understood as we are going to be working in the future with Mercer um, on uh, future uh, rate methodology. That's where we understood that we just need to choose a start time. Uh, that start time was July 1st. And so that's why, you know, we will allow 
uh, you know, several quarters of data to be entered. So that way we have a good cycle of individuals receiving services. Uh, but, um, uh, but yes, uh, you know, we would, we would not want older data, uh, being put in there at this point in time. Okay. All right. Um. I think we have kind of gone through career planning. So with job development, uh, again, the series of questions, the help text, acceptable values, uh, job development is another one where um, it asks for the activities that have been done, the distinct activities, uh, as well as the uh, uh, days spent on those activities. Uh, the main reason we have changed this to days spent is because um, we began to realize that some of the, the, the reporting of units uh, would make it look awkward, you know, if there was only 15 minutes spent on an activity, uh, but then there was one complete event. And so uh, we are looking at calendar days here and then um, uh, as opposed to actual units on the activities. Uh, again, in the job development, there's going to be times where you might check other. Uh, again, just noting that if you do check other that text is required. Uh, so we have an identification as to maybe what the activity was. Um, first time I'm pointing it out, uh, but uh, in each of the services, one of the last questions in all the services is whether or not services have been delivered using virtual delivery of supports. Um, again, if it has been, you know, just uh, simply note that it has been done. Um, and if it has been done, you know, then it's, um, uh, you know, how many units have approximately been used. This is again, just to help us with future, uh, rate methodology. Okay. With pre vocational services, uh, I'm going to kind of scroll by, uh, the questions here. Cause again, most of the questions at the beginning of every service are the same, uh, but pre vocational and support and employment is where we get to uh, a response on activities um, and skills that are being developed by the individual. Uh, so this is, if you can picture it, we'll show a picture here in a little bit. This is where we have a table of skills, and then you have to indicate whether or not that skill is or is not being um, developed as part of the activity. Uh, we do have here in red that at least one skill must be selected. Uh, we did note in the first uh, reporting period that some individuals went through the forums and without identifying any skill or goal being developed, either in pre vocational or in employment. Um, you know, those were some activities that will need to be or corrected. Um, and so we are just reminding folks that you have to select at least one, uh, one activity. So even if the forum lets you get through, uh, just note there must be at least one activity that's being developed. Uh, we had tried to build in some logic to where um, every answer was yes, and you had to select no to back out of it. Uh, but when we did early testing of this last October and November, the uh, providers who were part of the employment advisory team uh, saw that as being too many steps. So we changed it to where, um, you know, you just have to answer yes or no, but there's not really a way to make sure that at least one question is yes, other than the review process. Uh, so again, we're just flagging you here that you have to select yes on at least one of these. And if you don't, just be prepared uh, for that to not be accepted for payment uh, and to get a notification from Guidehouse of a required correction. Okay. Um, support employment. Uh, again, support employment has the same skills listed as being developed on the job as pre vocational. Um, here is the operational definition uh, of each of those types of skills or activities. So that way you know whether or not it is the skill that's being developed. If none of these pre populated ones meet the criteria, there is another, and again, this is where I would ask you to provide us 
two or three words of what that skill is uh, being developed, because if we begin to see that being added by multiple users, then we can go back in and add it as uh, one of the pre-populated fields. Okay, uh, with support employment, um, one of the things that I'll point out here is one of the earlier questions in the field is um, if the individual has multiple jobs or not. Um, if a person has multiple jobs, then you would need to complete the additional report, which is a separate report uh, for each uh, employment. So your first job would be completed within the support employment report. And then the second job would be being reported in the additional uh, employment um, report template. And we'll show you an example of that. But we have seen instances where people completed the reporting in the additional job report without having completed it here in the uh, primary support employment report. Uh, those have uh, typically resulted in, in uh, uh, being notified of a correction activity. And that's just so that way we, we always know that we're having uh, reports entered uh, within the uh, same report for response consistency. Um, see, again, uh, just to see the, all the questions with the help text and then again, examples of what is considered an acceptable value. Okay, so I am going to uh, stop sharing my screen. Uh, again, I'm sorry, just real quickly at the bottom of the document is actually a printout of red caps. So you can see all the questions that appear. Uh, so if you want to reference how the questions appear here or go back and look at the reference guide, you have all of those uh, appendices within one document. Okay, so I will Turn it back over to Sarah and Sarah, if you want to go into the test site, I know we wanted to look at the data export feature. Uh, we had the question from May on units delivered and then um, uh, we were also going to look at the um, tables. Sure, well, let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, please note what I'm showing you is all dummy test data within the site. So everything you're seeing in there is made up information. Uh, we use the test sites in order to try out um, some, you know, some of the logic and data validation pieces within it before we share, we push it to the live site to share with everyone. So we do our best to test through it prior to pushing it out. So, as you see here, this is when you click on a specific individual within the site, this is the table that you see uh, that then has you know, the provider information, the DMH ID, and then all of the different services and the necessary um, data collection interest instrument that goes with that. Um, when you get into a specific data collection instrument, I'm just going to open uh, pre vocational here. This is a new one. We've not put anything in here. Um, at the top of the page, you'll see actions right here where it says download PDF of instrument. If you do click that, you can download a blank form or you can also download this form with the data in it. So if you want to download that to keep that for your records, um, you're more than able to do so. Um, it does download as a PDF um, and you'll be able to save it and print it as needed. And then as so I believe that might have been uh, Richard's question. No, or I guess it was Terry's question. So Terry, does that answer on how to go and export the data? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. And you more than welcome to download every single one, whatever you need to do that, you're able to do that. And then as Dwayne mentioned too, there is uh, some data validation, some skip logic that's within this within these forms. So as you answer questions, you will see some questions or you won't see some questions. It's designed that we're only collecting the information that's necessary based on your responses 
and the guide does have every question in there. So you may read something within the guide that is not necessarily what you're seeing on screen. And in the screen that um, Sarah currently has open, and if you need to enlarge it, um, each person on the call should have a, um, uh, a zoom in feature just right above the image here uh, where you can click and zoom in to, to make it a little easier for you to read on your uh, monitor. Uh, but the service start date question <laughs> that we talked about is right there immediately below the, 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 the green field there. Uh, and you can see there is help text there that says first date in which billable activity occurred. Um, that's where in the guide, you know, we expanded that language to say first date in which billable activity occurred, regardless of which performance period uh, that uh, might have been in. So, uh, so again, this question is really helping us, let's say 18 months from now, go back and measure, uh, you know, what was the statewide average on the uh, number of days it took for people to complete career planning, or what was the statewide average you know, it took on completion of benefits planning. Uh, so that's why we want to ensure it's the very first date that billable activity occurred for the service, not just that specific authorization or that reporting period. Uh, so again, um, we have some data that we're not gonna be able to use uh, because we were seeing this start date be all over the map uh, when people had multiple uh, reports entered already. Uh, some of them, I think we corrected uh, or asked for correction, but I think we got to the point of time to where um, we just said we'll, we'll get it cleaned up uh, later um, because it, it was uh, it would otherwise just slow down the review process. But moving forward, we really need this to be the start date of when billable activity occurred. And Sarah, if you can scroll down just a little bit. Uh, so pre-vocational is one of the ones we were talking about where uh, you have to select at least one goal. Uh, that language is already there uh, in the top left-hand field. You'll see where it says at least one skill goal must be in development. Um, you know, so we have to ensure that uh, someone, you know, that you're selecting at least one yes uh, throughout this field. Um, uh, you know, there's not really a way to make the business logic not accept the form uh, with all being selected. No, so uh, again, this is really up to each of you all that you're entering to make sure that you select a yes. Uh, just to understand uh, as part of the review process, if at least one's not accepted as yes, then it will be sent back for correction. But you can really help us speed up that process and speed up your own payment of this by just making sure that you select yes on at least one area. Uh, on the developmental progress on the right, um, I know what we did see is, uh, I think maybe some individuals didn't select yes because they didn't know how to best complete uh, the field on the right, because once you select yes, it will not allow you to save the form unless You've identified the baseline, the current threshold, and targeted threshold. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, these are expectations in the service definitions based upon the revised uh, waiver language in uh, that went into place in fall of 21. Is that there's supposed to be an identification of best baseline and um, current progress and what the targeted process is. So just be mindful. These are things that should already be have been collected for uh, almost two years now. Uh, but if you don't quite have it in a way where you can quantify the percentage, uh, ultimately just provide your professional judgment on where the uh, initial baseline was. Just provide your best judgment on where the current is at uh, and what the target uh, targeted threshold is. So if you don't have all the data collected in a way to where you can figure it's 29.35%, don't get caught up in that. Just, you know, if you feel like it's happening somewhere between 26 to 50% of the time based upon your observations, uh, then go ahead and just select, uh, you know, that particular uh, measurement field. We do have it in percentage as well as kind of a, um, a definite, 
as well as kind of an observable of undeveloped, developing, demonstrated, and, and, and mastering. But we do want to know, uh, you know, again, what that target threshold is, because not everybody needs to demonstrate uh, every activity 100% of the time, you know, and so uh, uh, just let us know what that target threshold percentage is. And then, Sarah, I know you wanted to kind of hit down the bottom uh, with the um, attestation and, and digital signature and, and completion. Yes, so every form um, not and this is not just for employment. This is across every incentive, every form that's within red cap um, for each incentive. We are looking. We do have this provider attestation that we are asking that you both type your name in. Enter the date and then you add a signature. Um, we, if there is no signature, we will send it back. And all you do is click the add signature. It brings up the attestation and then you use your mouse or if you have a touch screen, you know, then you would sign your name here and save your signature. That is required for every form. Um, and then below that, there are two questions on the form review where we're asking around the completion of said record. Um, and this is what we're using to determine whether or not we need to go in and do a review of the record being submitted. So we do ask that you, once you are completed, you indicate yes here. And then this is the last question here where it asks if it's complete. It automatically defaults to incomplete and you must change from incomplete to complete in order to kind of trigger that review process at the end of the reporting period so it does get reviewed for payment. Yeah, so kind of the the, uh, the process that's followed on the back side of the review is uh, once everything's been completed uh, for a particular individual by a provider, um, then what GuideHouse does is go in and look at all of those in the dashboard that are marked as green, meaning that they've been completed. And so to be marked as green, as completed, uh, this last box of complete has to be um indicated uh as well as all fields um completed uh so once it's marked as uh green in the uh field um that you know lets guidehouse know to go in and review the form they look at all the answers at the top uh, here at the bottom the reason the type signature and electronic signature is needed and that it's ready for review is that your confirmation? Because essentially this is serving as an invoice. Uh, so this is all your confirmation that you, everything you've provided is accurate. You've got supporting data to verify all that you've provided, uh, that you're attesting to that, uh, and that you are uh, indicating that it's all fully completed and that it's ready for um, invoice processing. So, Sarah, I don't know if you can kind of go back to the previous field or go back to the, the, the dashboard. So, uh, when all that's been done, that's why it will appear as green, uh, like you see here next to benefits planning and career planning and job development. In this example, uh, either fields haven't been uh, completed that are required or there's validation errors uh, with the data that was entered to where it's not allowing you to, to, to save the form uh, or that final uh, step of electronic signature and marking the form as complete has not been done. Yes, in this case, these forms are not marked as complete. They're still marked as incomplete. And so that's why we have the red there. So as reviewers, we're, if we see something that's red, we don't review it. It has to be completed and marked as complete in order for it to be reviewed. As part of the learning process, um, we were flexible on that during the first uh, reporting period that closed in March because it gave us an opportunity to see maybe what was occurring or not occurring so then we could be better informed in developing the guide uh, and refining the process. Uh, but moving forward, uh, you know, uh, they will need to be green in order to be reviewed. Um, also, if you've inadvertently put someone in or you started a form and you realize that person's really not in that service, um, how would they go about correcting that, um, Sarah? 
Yeah, great question. Um, if if that happens, we realize it does happen. Just reach out to us uh, with to the DMH email address. Um, reach out to us. Let us know the record ID number. Every record that you put in here has a record ID. In this case, this one's one. Um, it should be a four digit number um, followed by a dash and then another number. If you provide that information to us and what it is that you accidentally entered or got duplicated, we are more than happy to work with you to go in and then remove that. So we can delete it out as admins in the system to make it easier to keep data clean, not only you know for you and all of that, but also helps us on the other end too, as we aggregate this information um, down the road and do, you know, reporting on it, um, we can keep that data clean. So at any point that you accidentally entered something in um, and you would like it removed, please reach out to us and we're happy to work with you to get it cleaned up. And if there is any clarity again, beyond the, the uh, desk guide, you know, please also send that to the, um, uh, VBP mailbox also because you know that is a document that we'll be uploading onto our website and it would be easy for us to revise it. Um, I know guide house has looked at over 700 report entries already. Mm -hmm. I've personally looked at over 400 reports uh, already. And so we think we have a pretty good idea of what is occurring, what's not occurring, where some of the questions may arise, where we need to clarify language. Uh, I know for some, I followed up to ask them kind of what was the uh, uh, the debate that they had internally when they provided an answer. So that way we can understand maybe where we needed to clarify language. But if you are having any concerns and if the guide's still not providing the uh, level of specificity that you might need, you know, again, just email the the uh, VVP mailbox and you know we can, we'll continue to revise that document. So uh, I know Vinay had the question about the units delivered, and I believe it was specific to career planning. So I don't know, Sarah. I think that's our last currently unanswered question. So I don't know if you can go into that there. So uh, Vinay, what I want to check on is so um, Sarah. I think you'll need to go ahead and hit um, yes. And so, Vinaya, I'm assuming, are you talking about the fact that there's two fields here? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. it, and this is the one where, honestly, from the back end of it, we don't know why we have two of boxes popping up here. It doesn't look this way on the back end and on our test site, but it is showing up here where there are two fields. So, I've been entering a zero into the box where your cursor is and then the total then the accurate number of units delivered in the box that says enter units delivered and then i get that error message um gotcha okay um we when, are, this when is there's a zero yeah. but i didn't want to leave the box blank and it, it won't it may not let you either so yes this is something thank you for bringing that up that is something Dwayne and i are trying to figure out why this is occurring um because on the the, the design side of it that I see that we're trying to work through, it doesn't show up like this. Um, yes. So, for example, if uh, Sarah, if you just choose any service start date and, and you know, whatever date you want to select there, and then uh, an end date. Okay, so you will see the length of time of career planning auto populates there in days. What we are wanting here is, you know, what the um, collective number of, of units that have been delivered for the service. Um, that was the intent of this field. I think what's happened somewhere is the questions dropped. Um, but yeah, we, we need to figure that out. And so, I, what I would say, Vinay, is um, if it's giving you an error on the left, just make sure you put in the same answer in both fields. Okay, in both fields, enter the total number of units provided. Mm -hmm. For the time being, and I've made a note, and like I said, we're trying to work through why this is coming up twice, but if you just enter the same number on both, well, we made a note that that's 
that right now that's acceptable while we figure out what's happening. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, uh, I was going to give the example of the dates. So what we have seen as an example is, um, uh, and, and I don't know if you can go to a, a fresh report. Yep. Sarah? I can. And let's go into job development. So currently, as we're here on May 10th, um, the reporting period for quarter three fiscal year two is open. Uh, so the data I would be completing for job development would be activity that occurred during the performance period of January 1st to March 31st. Um, what we have seen is uh, individuals go ahead and select uh, yes, that the individuals finished job development, uh, select yes, that they've successfully finished job development, and then they'll put a service end date of today, May 10th. And it's because they know they got a job today. Uh, but keep in mind, uh, and if you scroll back up, um, well, and, and this one's not going to show that, but the top does show what recorder, what reporting period you're entering. So just remember, even though you may know today, May 10th, the person became employed, if you're filling this out for data, uh, that occurred January 1st to March 31st, then really, if the individual wasn't employed at that point in time, then uh, you should not be answering yes that the person's um, ended the service and they ended it successfully, because in January to March, they were still actively receiving the service. Uh, so again, just a reminder, you're, you're always reporting for the reporting period and just that which was delivered during that reporting period and or what was known at that time uh, during that reporting period. So this would be no different than if you were doing progress notes and you're three weeks behind, but you know, you know, today someone got employed, or, you know, if you were doing progress notes uh, for April, you wouldn't be including, you know, progress for May and, and April progress notes, you know, and so, same type of thing, you, you know, you're, you're providing uh, reporting data uh, for the activity um, of January 1st and March 31st. And I apologize if that's confusing, but I'm hopeful that's coming across on, on what we're trying to clarify there. Okay, any other questions? I think we've uh, shown examples of Items that we'd spotlighted as we went through the guide. I think we've shown examples of questions that were asked. And some of the uh, typical examples that we've seen where we've had to submit things back for correction. Anything else to add, sir, or does anyone have any other questions? Okay, hearing none and seeing none. Um, we appreciate your all's assistance. Uh, we definitely can tell you're busy. We've been very busy ourselves and trying to get through uh, all the reporting fields. Uh, and um, uh, you will be receiving notifications shortly on all those that have been accepted, uh, as well as ones that may not have been accepted. Uh, and um, again, if there are any questions, uh, please feel free to send those to the uh, uh, dmh.dd.bbp uh, mailbox. All right, thank you guys.